ki google scholar alerts you will be seeing uh, papers by franco nori on all sorts of subjects so he is a theoretical physicist worked in all sorts of um, fields uh, starting from quantum computation uh, condensed matter physics quantum optics complex uh, systems non linear dynamics you name anything in uh, theory uh, you will find his paper there so with uh, this introduction uh, i invite professor uh, nori to give his uh, talk on virtual photons in ultra strongly coupled systems uh, oh hello professor, uh, can, you, uh, can you hear me yeah we can hear you okay great so uh, i would like to talk about thank you for the introduction for uh, i would like to talk about virtual photons in ultra strongly coupled systems on how to do quantum nonlinear optics without photons i'll explain this in a moment it's a uh, so therefore let me see if i can get here the uh, the next slide oh here it is so I would like to thank the organizers for their kind invitation. This is a haiku, is a three lines uh, Japanese style poem. And then I will start with a brief introduction to light matter interactions or photons inside cavity. Then address the question on how to extract these photons from the vacuum. And then finally, how to study uh, nonlinear optics of these virtual photons in ultra strongly coupled systems. So let's start with light matter interactions or photon side cavities. So this will be a brief introduction. This is an important subject. I'll go a bit fast, but it's a, I think it will be pedagogical slide. So you put, you consider a cavity where the photons are moving back and forth many, many times and they're act interacting with an atom. The coupling is this dipolar coupling between the electric field at the location of the atom and the actual dipole moment of the atom. So this is cavity QED. The problem with this is that the atoms are very small. Their dipole moment is very small. Their size is very small. So the light matter coupling is way too small. So this has been a problem for a long time. So how do you solve this problem? Well, people were trying to make the atom larger. How do you make the atom larger? You excite the atom to a large end limit. It's called Rydberg atoms. The Rydberg atoms are much larger and in electric field, they can be elongated like an antenna. So therefore, uh, these studies eventually led to the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2012 to Serge Haroche for work he did in collaboration with Jean-Michel Raymond, Michel Brun, and others in Paris. And the Rydberg atoms are hydrogen atoms which are excited. They are roughly a thousand times larger than typical atoms. They are sent through the cavity one by one. And at the exit, they reveal the presses or axes of a photon inside the cavity. These are superconducting knobby mirrors, so the photons are moving back and forth. These are microwave photons, about centimeter length, uh, wavelength. So the photons, they bounce back and forth inside this small cavity, which is about one inch or so, between two mirrors for more than a tenth of a second. Before it disappears, the photon will have traveled a distance of one trip around the Earth. So the photon is moving back and forth many, many times, and the coupling is still weak. But they were still were able to find interesting phenomena. So you have the atom there, which you need to excite to make it larger, otherwise the dipole coupling is too small. And then you excite the atom back and forth between the excited state and the ground state and versus time. The system eventually decays because of decoherence. That was... 1980s, 1990s, etc. But then in the in this century, people start taking a, a superconducting qubit, could be the flux qubit or charge qubit, is a flux qubit, and then replace the natural atoms by artificial atoms. In a flux qubit, you have aluminum here with barriers. This is oxide barriers. So these barriers are denoted by this X. So there are three Joseon junctions here, three barriers typically are coupled to resonators, in this case, an LC circuit. And when you change the magnetic field here, it coupled with the magnetic field here. So you can actually get flux in and out of the loop in a controlled manner. 
So you can actually excite the qubit and bring it into resonance with the resonator, which is a cavity. So instead of having a cavity uh, made of metal here, you have this resonator acting like a cavity. And this acts like an atom. So you need to think of this as the circuit replacing the atom and the metallic plates replaced by LC resonator. The advantage is that the coupling is much stronger. How strong? About five orders of magnitude. So the coupling is massively stronger. So therefore this changed the game completely. This became a completely different ball game. The, the locations are fixed before the atoms they were moving. The arbitrary interaction time, scalability. So therefore it, this was like a much, much, much better uh, system to look at. And then, uh, uh, you see here, okay. So therefore, uh, let me go into the next slide here. If you wanna see a review on this topic, we have several, uh, this one's here. The, there's a free PDF in our website. It's atomic physics and quantum optics using superconducting circuits is very pedagogical is only 11 pages, but that's the longest you could get in a nature review, They're typically much shorter. And then there is another one, which is even shorter, it's about 5.5 pages, Physics Today is also available online, is very pedagogical, very few equations, mostly pictures, cartoons, the main ideas. And then these circuits can behave like atoms making transition between different levels, and you can test quantum mechanics, a microscopic scales and can be used to conduct atomic physics experiments and quantum optics on a silicon chip. There are more recent reviews. There is this one here is very pedagogical. It's a free PDF in our website, but also the book has it open access because essentially we paid extra to get the open access. There is a very long review with different members of the group and collaborators on Microwave photonics with superconducting quantum circuits is also on our website, but if you want to start with the shorter ones, five pages, 11 pages, you get the main idea. And this one is a fairly pedagogical introduction, about 38 pages. So this one would be a good starting point. So let's look at, at, the, at the cavity here. So there are two level system here. Omega Q is the energy difference. G is the coupling. Omega C is the cavity frequency here. And the photons here can leak out with this uh, uh, constant kappa here, or can decay directly from the atom. And these in the strong coupling regime, the coupling is stronger than dissipation. And then you can take a quantum dot, which is a particle in a box. You can do see in the box, you can look at the photoluminescence. You have an, uh, a spectrum here, which is green, but on resonance and off resonance with the cavity, it, it behaves different. So these different atoms could be quantum dots or superconducting qubits or different artificial atoms. They behave differently depending on how they are in resonance or not with the, with the qubit here. So in the weak coupling, you can study Purcell effect can be used for ultra low threshold lasers, single photon sources. You made the coupling stronger. You can look at this quantum rabiosilation where the two level system can absorb the photon the atom is excited, then emits, absorb, and emits, and absorb, and emits, and so on. This was the starting point for the second generation quantum technologies, which is essentially quantum computing, uh, superconducting qubits, and many other systems in the past few years. But now people are trying to push even further. So the coupling to be stronger, not only the dissipation kappa or gamma, but also stronger than omega C and, um, and omega, and essentially every frequency of the system. If they're larger than about 10%, it's already in the ultra strong coupling regime. And this allows to study higher order and non perturbative effects here, which I'll describe today, including modified optoelectronics here, a quantum vacuum emissions, virtual photon engineering, light matter decoupling. So can you see one slide or two slides right now? You see, you see one slide? Yeah, it's one slide only. Okay, and the pointer, okay, good. 
Yeah, so a review it. on the ultra strong coupling regime was published a few years ago, and then the PDF file is available on our website. Otherwise, it's behind the paywall, but it's a uh, it's a uh, considered to be the the, the publisher said the most cited review in the journal the first few years. So the key points are the following. Ultrasound coupling can be achieved by coupling many dipoles to light or by using degrees of freedom whose coupling is not bounded by the smallness of the fine structure constant. The highest light matter coupling strengths have been measured in experimental Landau polaritons in semiconductors and superconducting quantum circuits. You see in a moment that as a function of time, the coupling keeps growing and growing. And with this ultra strong coupling, abbreviated as USC, standard approximations break down, like allowing processes that do not conserve the number of excitations in the system, leading to a ground state that contains virtual excitations, which I'll describe in a moment. Potential applications include fast and protected quantum information processing, which is being explored, I mean, now. New types of nonlinear optics, which I'll be talking today. Also, modified chemical reaction, which is a new field. Just people are people interested in this material science in chemistry, and the enhancement of different quantum effects. So, therefore, a different groups are beginning to experimentally explore this in different regimes. The experimental systems are the following. No, it could be either intersub band polaritons, superconducting circuits, Landau polaritons, organic molecules, automechanics. But these are recent developments. It was 16, 18, uh, some of them started earlier, but the, the strongest coupling have been quite recent. In the intersub band polaritons, you put aluminum arsenide, aluminum carbon arsenide, and in between you put multiple quantum wells, which you can think of them as a particle in a box. So therefore, you had this two-level system, your artificial atom, you put a probe and a substrate and, the, and, the, and the, the control pulse, and you probe the system. And the two-level system is this uh, particle in a box here. In this case, superconducting circuits, at this form, you put magnetic fields coupled to the loops here. There are just junctions here. Or Landau polaritons that also have these kind of confined wells. In this case, they're like a parabolic confined wells, and you target a few energy levels there. Or between the metallic plates made of, in this case, silver, you put different organic uh, materials, which are p dope, n dope, optical spacers, and, and then see how the system exchanges energies between the electric field inside the cavity and the actual uh, molecule system. Also, people are looking at optomechanics where there are essentially like very tiny cavities where the electric field is concentrated, becomes very strong, and then the light matter coupling becomes stronger because of this tiny, tiny uh, volume where the electric field is confined. And as a function of time, you see that the actual coupling strength has been increasing. And then we have data on 2018, and we didn't update this plot, but you can see there's a trend going up in the strong coupling, ultra strong coupling, and a few examples in the deep strong coupling regime involving superconducting circuits, Landau polaritons, organic molecules. Organic molecules are still way below. Intersubband polarities also below auto mechanics is mostly the first two superconducting circuits and Landau polaritons so far. And this is a summary of the different systems that people are actually exploring in order to see stronger and stronger light matter coupling. The popular models to study ultra strong coupling system are the quantum rabbi model. This is the workhorse. This is the basic system to, to, to start the, the, the This is without RWA, which means rotating wave approximation. If you assume the rotating wave approximation, the model becomes the James Cummings model. So we're going to see how to start 
from the general system here and how to obtain this one here and the, the comparison between both of them. We're not going to discuss today the N atom version, but the same idea of the quantum Rabin model. When you have N atom, there are two variations, the DK model, Hopfin model, but there are, are the N version, N atom version of the quantum Rabin model, and the James Cummings become the Tavis Cummings, but we're going to focus mostly on these two here for the time being to simplify the problem. So therefore, the basic system for cavity quantum electrodynamics is the one uh, shown here, where you have the following. You have harmonic oscillator, A dagger A, the qubit, sigma Z. Typically, this frequency will be omega Q and omega C for the cavity and the qubit. Let's put them equal to simplify. And this is the coupling, light matter coupling. This is A plus A dagger. This is for the photon field inside the cavity and sigma minus, sigma plus for the operators acting on the qubit. So this one excites it up, and this one pushes it down. Of course, there are energy losses gamma, and then there is the uh, interaction energy capital omega. So there are three energy scales. The bare energy omega of the light and the atom here assumed to be in resonance. It doesn't have to be, but to simplify. The dipole interaction energy, which is also called Rabi frequency, and the energy losses gamma, there is the interplay between this energy scale gives rise to different regimes. But the energy scales to keep in mind is cavity, qubit, and the coupling, and the energy losses. So therefore, when you increase the dipole interaction energy, also known as the Rabi frequency, you go from this weak to strong, ultra strong, and this strong coupling, depending on how this energy compares with the decay, the losses, dissipation, with uh, the cavity or qubit frequency. And then initially you see the Purcell effect, Rabi oscillations here, Harosh and Jean-Michel Raymond and Michel Brun and others virtual photons dress in the ground state and also a entangled ground state here. So there are different kinds of physics that can be appreciated and seen when you increase the coupling here. The most studied one has been strong and ultra strong coupling, or strong for the most part, ultra strong coupling in the past few years. The typical strategy is to start with good mirrors to have a low decay rate and read their atom, they have a high dipole moment. So you put them inside here and then you heat them up, you put them in, interact and you measure out. The more modern strategies to have artificial atoms like particles uh, in a box, electron in a box or superconducting circuits, which are one dimensional resonators. And then the a small volume, the coupling can be very, very strong the electric field is confined in a, in a small volume. When you have weak and strong coupling, the light interact with the photonic reservoir, matter with the matter reservoir. But when the coupling becomes very strong, you do not have matter separated from light. They're all essentially smashed up together. They're very strongly entangled. So therefore they interact with the photonic matter reservoir, but as a one unit not as a separate unit. So this is the review, as I was mentioning before, there are more details there, it's pedagogical review. Now, if you want to see more publications on this area, and there are also some presentations, some of these slides are there, PDF, PPT, they're all available on our website, just Google publications, my last name, Brickin, and they're all there in the ultra strong coupling folder. Now let us introduce the properties of the light matter ground state. So we're going to start with the quantum Rabin model and the James Cummings model and try to understand how to describe this theoretically. We saw before a variety of different experimental systems. Now let's try to model it theoretically. So let's start with the full Hamiltonian. There is here resonator, qubit, and the coupling. This is the standard James Cummings model, but for the Rabi Hamiltonian, you need to add all the terms, including this one here, because we had A plus A dagger, 
multiplying sigma plus and sigma minus, so you get four terms. So therefore, if you want to see the Hilbert space of the system, you first start simplifying the problem. You take, let's take temporarily Rabbit frequency to be zero. So therefore, a, uh, so no interaction. So then now the atom and the light are independent. So therefore you have the, the field can have n photons. It was zero, one, two, et cetera, three. The atom can be in two states, ground state, excited state, zero, one, asleep and awake, since there are only two possibilities. There. So therefore the system can be characterized very simply for the cavity with the photons and the atom. So there is no other possibilities. Now let's turn on this term and see what happens. When this, when you do that, so in the limit, when the Rabi frequency and this coupling is much smaller than omega, you can neglect the higher order term, which are called counter-rotating terms, obtaining the James Cummings Hamiltonian, also known as JC Hamiltonian, now the excited states hybridize. So before you had zero, one, two photons and ground states. Right now they hybridize, they just they split. You have this plus state and this minus state. The ground state doesn't change because the ground state is the cavity, which is empty, and the atom, which is asleep. So it seems the ground state is just the lowest energy state, which is no photons and no excitations. But the higher energy state, the hybridize. Now, what happens when you turn this term beyond the rotating wave approximation? In this regime, the ground state is a coherent superposition of state with different number of bare excitations. So the ground state, <coughs> sorry, is not enough zero photons on the ground state. In this case, you're actually having state where there is one photon excited state, two photon ground state, even though you're in the ground state. And this is puzzling because this is, this happens when you increase the coupling here, the coupling strength omega in terms of the cavity frequency and the cubic frequency, you increase and eventually it begins to deviate, a small deviation. Here there's also a shift. These shifts are, the analog of the Lamb shift that played an important role in the history of quantum electrodynamics because it actually validated that you needed to go beyond what you study in the quantum mechanic textbook because the Lamb shift could not be explained with the standard quantum mechanics. You had to go beyond this and you had to take photons in and out from the vacuum and this gave an initial important validation to quantum electrodynamics that was developed by Schwinger, Tomonaga, Feynman, and uh, a, other people also at the Institute for Advanced Studies, uh, Freeman Dyson, and many others. There were quite a few people working on, on QED. Yeah. So therefore, this is an example of lamp In the lamp shift, you have Coulomb interaction. In this case, there are not. There is spherical symmetry, there is not. So this would be like more modern controlled version of the lamp sheet which can be implemented on a chip, on a circuit. The expected number of photons in the ground state is non-zero. And these are called virtual photons since they cannot be spontaneously emitted because the ground state has the lowest energy. So in this case, the virtual photons are trapped there. So in classical physics, the vacuum is empty. In quantum mechanics, the, the, there are fluctuations even in the vacuum state. So therefore the vacuum is empty on average, but with fluctuations that can be described as virtual particles that spontaneously appear and disappear in pairs. So this is one of the key ideas of quantum electrodynamics. So therefore, you had these virtual particles, the spontaneous appears if you're in pairs. So this vacuum fluctuation is called virtual particle bubbles. So they start here and then they annihilate. So an idea that was proposed by Moore in 1970 was to add a mirror here. Sorry, I pushed it wrong. 
So the mirror is located here. And if you could oscillate the mirror very, very fast, like this, then you could actually break the pairs. And if you do that, then you produce correlated photon pairs. And this is this has been historically called by Schwinger and others dynamic Casimir effect, although is not due at all to Casimir. It's a, it's a misnomer. It's a complete misnomer. It's very unfortunate because this was pre predicted in 1970. The static Casimir effect was 1948. The lamp shift 1947. So it's a completely different phenomena, but anyhow, historically was assigned to. Now, in this case, you're breaking the fast oscillating mirror is breaking these uh, bubbles, creating correlated photon pairs. The event horizon on a black hole is acting like a very fast moving mirror because it also breaks virtual particles. So Moore was in 1970, Hawking in 1974, say, okay, let us consider these bubbles away from the event horizon so they recombine. But when they are located at the event horizon, one photon is trapped, the other photon goes out, and that's Hawking radiation. So therefore, the pairs of virtual particles are broken up, one being trapped, and the other escaping. And this is an example of so-called vacuum quantum vacuum effects. So the first one was the lamp shift, 1947, where this energy could not be described by the usual quantum mechanics you see in textbooks. You had to go to QED. And 1947, then in uh, Actually, sorry, in 19, oh, these are physical phenomena due to quantum fluctuations that have no classical counterparts. The next one is the Casimir Force, 1948, the experiment done by Lamorio in 1997, and also Federico Capasso has done some very beautiful experiments afterwards. So probably the best experiments right now would be Federico Capasso uh, on, on the Casimir effect. Then uh, the dynamic Casimir effect involves the oscillating mirrors and there are also the Hawking radiation, Unruh effect, etc. These are all described in a unified manner in a review of modern physics, which we published some time ago. And then we tried to the question I was asking at the time with a collaborator and a couple of postdocs in the group is how to relate these effects. We all know they're all due to quantum fluctuation, but how to link them together and then we were linking on them from the point of view of quantum optics which is unusual most people think of them in terms of you know, relativity or you know space time it's like quantum optics you can consider here the non-degenerate parametric amplifier where there is a pump nonlinear medium and a signal and an idler so the principal parametric amplifier the pump pump photon is down converted by nonlinear medium to a signal and idler photon and the frequency here add up to that of the pump photon. So you get this uh, down conversion. So we found ways to go from the parametric amplifier to the Unruh effect, to the Hawking radiation, to the Nagasimir. I'll be going very quickly here. The relationship between them, which I don't think has been described like this anywhere else besides in our review. So this is kind of more of an original. Counterclockwise, you start with the parametric amplifier. So you start with the single mode of the vacuum. They share the same form of Bogolio transformation. This transformation to allow you to diagonalize the Hamiltonian is a rotation, essentially, it's a rotation of operators. And they both exhibit two mode squeeze states using language of quantum optics. And then the Unruh effect is in turn connected to Hawking radiation through so the equivalence principle re relating inertial and gravitational acceleration. And there is an exponential redshift. The Doppler shift of the field most near the black hole horizon produces a Bogolio transformation. Again, it's a rotation of operators that are identical to those, the ones, the Casimir effect. Provided the mirror trajectory is given by some equation in our review. And then you can obtain essentially identical Doppler shift leading to a thermal spectrum of the emitted radiation. And then finally, the dynamic Casimir effect, that should be called the Moore effect, and the degenerate parametric amplifier can be related by considering the case of a single mode cavity 
with a sinusoidally dependent boundary condition. So all these effects can be understood from the point of view of quantum optics. These effects were first discovered in seemingly only the context, but this universal description of quantum amplification provided by this Bogolio transformation, this rotational operator, so yet these mechanisms are indeed very closely related which people know, but I mean, we try to do them in a, in a more quantitative manner. So now from all of these, let's focus briefly on the dynamic asymmetry effect here. These can be studied with superconducting circuits by putting a squid here, the superconducting quantum interference device. You put here two junctions here, you put a magnetic field oscillating very fast gigahertz frequencies, and then you're effectively creating a mirror that oscillates very fast, but it's not a mechanical mirror. It's an electromagnetic mirror that can, that can oscillate at significant fraction of the speed of light, like a quarter to a half or so, even higher. So therefore, this is a way to force these virtual photos to be emitted. And this has been measured, has been seen in a collaborators in Chalmers in a beautiful experiment they did because this creates a non-adiabatic modulation of the Rabi frequency. So therefore, instead of having a mirror oscillating very fast, creating these correlated photon pairs was replaced, like a, is like a quantum emulator or quantum simulator or quantum analog computer. The mechanical mirror was replaced by a, a two junctions acting like a superconducting quantum interference device and then oscillates very fast, like a fast mirror creating photons in the coplanar waveguide. Now let's switch gears into a brief history of optics, not a brief history of time. So therefore, when people had very many photons, they were studying them using classical optics. Over time, people studying few photons using quantum optics. And in the past, uh, recent times, people have been interested in single photon generation, single photon detection. So this is all quantum optics. And as you can see here, if you start from many photons, few photons, one photon, it's clear that the future of optics, the next natural step is to do optic with no photon, which I'll call it Zen quantum optics or vacuum uh, quantum optics, where you can actually use these virtual photons in order to obtain interesting effects. And it's a natural progression from many photons to few to one and the next step to zero. So now let's, let's go into how to do quantum optics with no photons here. No real photon, but virtual photons. This work done in collaboration with uh, Anton Fritz Kockum is a former postdoc right now, it's a faculty at Chalmers University. And these are former postdoc, one of them is still, but they all became faculty. This is a Professor Savasta, Di Stefano, Macri, Stasi, they're all left and moved back to Italy. And then a collaborator, Adam Miranovic in Poland, who is a long-term collaborator in the group. So one example of the kind of thing you can do with this kind of uh, quantum optics is to consider two atoms in the ground state and one photon in the cavity, and this photon could excite both atoms. This is typically not possible because one photon typically cannot excite two atoms simultaneously, but in the ultrasound coupling limit, you can briefly borrow a second photon from chance fluctuations in the vacuum within the cavity via this virtual transition here with this dashed line. It's a virtual transition. And then it can decay via virtual processes into this state and then this state here. This can be studied analytically, this can be studied numerically, perturbatively, and then things match uh, nicely here. So therefore, the last sentence of our preprint was, we hope that this work on one photon simultaneously exciting two or more atoms could simultaneously excite two or more referees and indeed simultaneously excited three referees and the editor because it was chosen as an editor's choice here uh, because there is a symbol here so they everybody liked it so the prediction work at least at the referee level so the key here is to consider the cavity 
a resonator mode, is this one here, A dagger A omega C, and the intracavity field operator is A plus A dagger, that's X here. This A plus A dagger is coupled with sigma X sigma Z or sigma plus sigma minus, there are different ways to write it. This one here breaks parity symmetry with sigma Z. This is the one which is diagonal and breaks parity symmetry. The off diagonal one allows you to go from ground state to excited state and vice versa. That's proportional to sigma X. This is the qubit Hamiltonian, Q and the cavity here. And the Pauli operators, the diagonal and the off diagonal are there. So you diagonalize your Hamiltonian with some parameters here. You choose some theta and some coupling in terms of the qubit. You can get many energy levels. And you see that many of them are crossing, but when you look at them carefully, they're not crossing. It looks like they're crossing, but in reality they are. There is something called avoid level crossing, which means that the system is oscillating back and forth between these two states. So therefore the atom here is the ground state, ground state, excited state. So, so this is the, the photon in the cavity. The cavity photon is absorbed, so the cavity remains empty. There are zero for the cavity, but the atoms are excited. So therefore, and then there is this Rabi oscillations between this superposition state when they are superposed plus or minus. So it, it looks like they are crossing, but they are not. And then these two split eigenstates at the minimum split correspond to these maximally entangled three particle states. You can do analogous result when the atoms are non identical. And uh, now you can also study these when you do coherent impo input pulse driving. So, therefore, you have uh, the driving is of this form, it's a cosine, but then you put a pulse. The pulse is a sharp Gaussian at T naught. So therefore the system is in the ground state and you bang, you send it right here at the avoid the level crossing. And you want to know what happens there. Well, what happens there is the following. The pulse is here. So you're kicking the system, you're exciting it and suddenly bingo, pop, there is one photon in the cavity. But then the photon in the cavity is absorbed and then you get two qubits excited. And the qubits decay and then provide a photon in the cavity. The photon in the cavity excited too, and then they are going back and forth. There's an exchange of energy between the cavity that has occupation number one, one photon in the cavity, and the excitation of the qubits zero, or the two qubits excited and the photon uh, gone because it essentially is absorbed. So the mean photon number is again a plus a dagger. You do expectation value and then you monitor this operator as a function of time. For the atom mean excitation number, you don't do a plus a dagger, you do sigma plus plus sigma minus. And then you look at this atom mean excitation number and you can actually monitor this exchange of energy which you actually, you pumped it initially. You excite the system and the system begins to exchange energy with the cavity, photonic part, and the atom part. This is with no damping, so it never decay, but in reality, there is damping. We are damping, essentially, the oscillations eventually go down over time. And you can see how the two atom correlation function behaves. With some decay, there is some slight shift over time, but they typically follow each other here. So now we propose a physical process which is analogous to spontaneous parametric down conversion, where one excited atom directly transfers the excitation to two spatially separated atoms with probability approaching one. The interaction is mediated by the change of virtual photons rather than real photons. This nonlinear atomic process is coherent and reversible. So the pair of excited atoms can transfer the excitation back to the first one and it become like some frequency generation. You can do down conversion and up conversion. So it's reversible, it's coherent. It can be expanded. So let's focus on this one here, down conversion, up conversion. And eventually we're going to see that this can be expanded to different kinds of processes. Three-way mixing, four-way mixing, uh, care effect, pockets effect, cross care, all kinds of nonlinear effects. 
So therefore, the basic workhorse, you have the qubit here, several qubits could be one, two, three, let's start with one or two first, and then we add more if you want. The cavity, let's start with one, could consider also two or three to start with. And the Hamiltonian cavity is this, and there is a coupling here. The coupling has this part that breaks uh, parity, and this one here, which is the diagonal term, the off, uh, diagonal off diagonal term here, interaction Hamiltonian. So one example, three qubit mixing, qubit one, two, and three, and the energy of this one here is equal to the energy of one plus two, because you want to exchange energies back and forth between them. In order to do that, then you want this energy here to be split between one and two, so you need this condition here. So you look at the different energy levels, you look at the crosses, say, hey, they're crossing, but you magnify it and say, wait a moment, they're not crossing. And you can see here is that the ground state, the two atoms are in the ground state, but then they get excited and then they go back to the ground state. So therefore there is here an, uh, an exchange of energy between these two atoms that decay, exactly these two atoms that decay uh, and then to the ground state, exciting the third one. Here it is exactly. So therefore the, the third one is in the ground state, but then it gets excited because it's absorbing the energy of the first and the second one. So again, the third one is asleep and it wakes up because the other ones just uh, give them energy to wake up. So this exchange, this can be described by this Hamilton here, where when the third one loses energy, the first one gets energy and vice versa. Permission conjugate is the opposite process. You can study perturbation theory. So in reality, to get from here to there, there are many intermediate steps involving the, the, the blue lines here corresponds to the, the continuous lines, a real photon processes. Like in this case, uh, the first atom is excited, decays to the ground state, and then provides a photon to the cavity. So this case is a natural thing to happen. But then this photon in the cavity can excite either the second atom or the third atom. And these ones are real processes. This one will be virtual process. And some of them involve in sigma z, some of them involve in sigma x, and that's why there are these dash blue and dash red ones. But eventually you get to this step here. So there are many virtual processes going from this stage here to this stage here. This can be all adaptive perturbation theory, can be done analytically in some regimes, can be done numerically in general. And then there's an example of how this looks like. It's a three qubit mixing. You excite the system and then a, you're populating qubit three. And qubit one and two are in the ground state. But then qubit three, which is excited here, decays and provides energy to the first two qubits, one and two. These two, atoms, these two atoms decay and provide energy to the third one and so on. So they're, the energy is being passed on between them. And at this point here, you get the superposition states between them. So this is the time evolution of the population of qubit one, three, and the correlation between one and two. Of course, you can do here for four qubit mixing, you can look in this case, two qubit mixing, three, four, in this case, in the four case, you can see here that the first, and the last atoms are excited, they decay to the ground state and provide energy to the middle two ones. So this is what you see here, the two of them are decaying, providing energy to the other two ones. And you can analyze all of them. They look like, if you look at this one here, it looks like they're crossing, but they are not. These are avoid the level crossing, which means that the system is in a superposition state and it's oscillating between one and the other one. And there are more complex process here, which have been studied in detail now work here. So therefore, if you excite the system, you can get here a four particle G exist like state. This is not gigahertz. This means Greenberg, Horn, Zeilinger state involving four qubits here, which can be obtained spontaneously with this process. And you can have qubit one and four excited, but qubit two or three are in the ground state. Then two or three are excited, qubit one and four in the ground state. So the energy is being passed along between, between some atoms, 
they are sent into the other atoms and back and forth. So you can actually design your your volleyball game of the energy going back and forth between them. So therefore, we have presented a few examples of quantum linear optical process that have been uh, discussed in details. What about a general theory of quantum linear optics in the ultra strong coupling regime, including Raman scattering and uh, hyper Raman and some other ones. So therefore, let's look at deterministic quantum linear optics, which is very different from the standard one. With single atoms, very few, let's do one or two, and virtual photons. And then they're all described in more detail in our website there. So therefore, let's look at an outline of this part. So we're looking about light matter coupling, which is the theme of this talk, and the connection linear optics. So first, we're going to look at three-way mixing analogs and four-way mixing analogs, and also Pogos effect, care effect, cross care, etc. Let's start with the simplest model. You have here one resonator, one cavity, and one qubit. It cannot be simpler than this. Very simple. So there's one resonator mode, frequency omega A, coupled to one qubit, frequency omega Q here. Let's consider the quantum rabbit coupling Hamiltonian. A simple one is A plus a dagger and sigma X to make it simpler. So let's forget about sigma Z. See, this is the, the coupling between them, the Rabi energy. The coupling has to be larger than the decay to get a strong coupling regime. If, you, if it is larger than 10% or so of omega A or omega Q, then you get the ultra strong coupling. We want to have an effective strong coupling. So this is Hamiltonian right there. So there is, you can do the James Cummings Hamiltonian. It's this one here where the atom decays and you're emitting a photon or the atom is excited and you absorb the photon with this copy here. This conserves the excitation number, N, which is equal A dagger A. You're counting the number of photons inside the cavity and sigma plus sigma minus, which is you're counting the excitation in the system. If the atoms are two atoms, they're both in the ground state, you get zero. If there's one excited, you get one. If there's two excited, you get two, and so on. So this is counting excitation number on the atom side and on the photonic side. In the quantum Rabi Hamiltonian, then you have A plus a dagger and also sigma minus sigma plus, both of them. This conserves parity, which is e to the i pi n, which is this one here could be zero, one, two is an integer here, conserves this number p. In general, there is the generalized Rabi Hamiltonian, which has no restrictions on the excitation number. So, so they're essentially, the, this is the most general case, and this is the one we're going to consider here. We have a plus a dagger, and you have sigma x, sigma z, is a general angle between them. And this angle can be rotated. Depending on the rotation, you can actually get this particular case sigma x, but in general, you can actually rotate in this uh, space of sigma operators. All of these systems can be studied experimentally using superconducting circuits. So what's exciting about this is they can actually create your atom. You design the atom you want, you can decide transition frequencies because different circuits allow this possibility. And after you design your atom, you can see that those properties on a chip. You can actually do quantum um, uh, nanoelectronics to study atomic physics and quantum optics, which can also be used to do quantum information, but that's a separate topic in a different field. But these are all related because this, this uh, activities of Google, IBM, and superconductor qubits have, uh, are based on the fact that you can actually create Hamiltonian that you can actually control. And that's the, so this is all related to quantum information, but I will not be focusing on information, I'll be focusing only on quantum optics, because today is quantum optics day. Now, but when we need to connect to classical nonlinear optics, classical nonlinear optics use take the polarization in a nonlinear uh, medium, and then you consider the higher order term, but these terms, epsilon, uh, sorry, E squared, E cubed, 
they only become relevant when there is high intensity light. So therefore, uh, that, uh, but we are not in the regime. We're also looking here, the initial state, the final state is a coupling. We have one atom, two atoms, three atoms, very few. We have one or two cavities, very few cavities, three at most for the moment. So we have an effective coupling between two system states, which are initial and final, mediated by higher order processes with high virtual photons that bring us to the initial state to the final state via these arrows that we saw before. In classical nonlinear optics, you look at the second harmonic generation, you essentially you look at this term, the E square, you write the cosine square as, as, as like this, and you can see that you, you get the two omega. So you get an omega in, you get two omega out. Actually, second harmonic generation was invented at the University of Michigan, very close to my office there by Peter Franken and Gabby Weinreich and uh, Ward and company, John Ward, that was many years ago, perhaps like 50 years ago, the yeah, anniversary. So nonlinear optics started there in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And then, but now we wanna bring it to the 21st century. We're gonna do it, not just the classical, we're gonna do it with this coupling here. So you start with this initial state here, and then you can go, the excited atom E can decay to the ground state, providing a photon to the cavity. And then you can borrow a photon from the vacuum fluctuation, and you go to the state here, or you borrow the photon from the vacuum fluctuation to the cavity, and then this photon goes here, and you, and you can get another photon you, you get here. The, so sorry, the excited atom provides the second photon you get here. There's a real transition with real photon. The standard one, these are virtual one. That's why they are dashed. So therefore, the red involves sigma z, which is one here. And these are virtual transitions, the blue sigma x, which are the real ones. Dash ones, n is not conserved because you're taking photons in and out of the vacuum. The solid ones, they conserve the number of excitations. So in this case, the atom number six excitation was one, goes to zero on the atom, but then you get one photon. So the n was n n was one, the n continues one. In this case, the n increases. X. So this is a simple case, but it can become far more complicated. So you start with the initial state, which is ground state two photons, and you get the excited state zero photons. It is an effective coupling that can be derived analytically. And in this case, the frequencies must satisfy some condition to be able for this to happen. So therefore, single photons, no external drive now. In the classical case, you need to have a strong pump in nonlinear optics is a different case. Now we're looking about deterministic processes in the, in the classical case, these are low efficiency nonlinear optics. This is a problem always in nonlinear optics, the, the efficiency is low. We're only considered two level atoms, in nonlinear optics they consider multi-level atoms. The photons are localized in resonators now uh, and uh, before they are like propagating waves. The, so let's consider three-way mixing. Three-way mixing can be, there are many different cases here. Could be general three-way mixing, which is two omegas added up, one like this. So this will be some frequency generation or difference frequency generation, this one here, or the general three-way mixing, which is also known as second harmonic generation, SAG, or up conversion, you see, or second subharmonic generation, which is also known as down conversion here. It is spontaneous Raman scattering, stimulated Raman scattering. There is the Stokes and anti stokes stimulated Raman. So there are many different possibilities. These get more complicated. So let's talk with a simpler one, which are like uh, down conversion, up conversion. The other ones are described in our papers here. So let's look at the summary of three way mixing process in linear optics and their deterministic analogs with single atoms and virtual photons. So here there are many cases, but let's start with the first column. So there is here, the process can be degenerate or non-degenerate. And in this case could be either up conversion, second harmonic generation, or down conversion, second harmonic generation. If it is non-degenerate, it could be spontaneous Raman or stimulated Raman, either Stokes and Day Stokes, could be some frequency generation, different, different frequency generation. So there are many, many different cases. So let's focus only on the cases inside 
this box that looks like a vacuum. So now things are simpler. So the cases there are done conversion. To make it simple, because consider one resonator, one qubit, to make it simple, two resonators, one qubit, or one resonator, two qubits. But you can put three, four, whatever. But let's start with one or two of each. There are some conditions. The qubit has to be twice the cavity frequency, or in this case, one cavity is twice the other to be able to exchange energy. And in this case, we saw this before, the excited atom decays and provides two photons to the cavity because the, it can do it. The conditions are there. Once you understand that conversion, you understand a conversion because it's exactly the same. You, just, you, you reverse the arrow. Instead of going 0e to 2g, you do the exactly opposite. So this is exactly the same, but you're flipping the arrows. <laughs> and the rest is the same. And the same is here. Once you understand the three of them, you understand the other three, and because they're like they're mirror symmetric. To describe them theoretically is the generalized rabbit model, all of them. And they are described in detail in this very long, long paper. These processes here change the number of excitations by one. So they require the generalized quantum rub interaction. So this requires the ultra strong coupling limit. And this considers essentially every case in linear optics we could think of, or actually there are some other ones, but essentially I'll show you in a moment, but there will be many cases here. Let me see if I can, if I can go to the next slide here. So in this case here, the left panel show all these virtual transitions that contribute to the down conversion process, which is second sub only generation, from here to here to lowest order. So you have a photon here that splits into two photons into this cavity here because the, 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 the frequencies are lower. So this has higher frequency. Essentially, the frequency of resonator A is twice the frequency of resonators B. So that's why this photon can provide two photons in this resonator. And the atom remains in the ground state. So the atom doesn't do anything. And then uh, the blue solid arrows, my transition that do not change number excitation. These are called the James Cummings model, these are the standard ones. The blue dash ones correspond to transitions that change the number of excitations by two. So these are non James Cummings terms, these are called quantum Rabin model. And the red dash arrows show transition that change the number of excitations by one. These transitions are mediated by the additional terms in the generalized Rabi model. So as you can see here, there are different kinds of process. Like in this case, the photon here excites the atoms. So it's a standard blue transition here. And then this excited atom here decays to the ground state, providing a photon here. But in order to go here, it needs to borrow a photon from the vacuum fluctuation. That's why there's a dash, dash red line here. And there are many other transitions that can be understood uh, one by one. So this case corresponds to two resonators, A and B, interacting with a qubit. This would be done conversion. So therefore, the two photons which are here move from resonator B to resonator A because they satisfy the right energy conditions here. And interaction Hamiltonian of this form here is completely general. And there is this virtual levels there. And this corresponds to two resonators and one qubit here, which is the one we saw before here, the middle one. Then another example here is the one we saw before, one resonator, one qubit, the interaction energy is A plus a dagger and this combination here. So you go from the two photons here can excite this atom or simultaneously the, the, uh, the Hermitian conjugate, the excited atom can, can actually provide two photons to, to, to the resonators. These are the virtual levels here, and that's the one where there is one resonator, one qubit. Or you could have the case where there is one resonator and two qubits, and they're coupling this one here, and then there are these virtual levels right there, and then this photon can simultaneously excite two atoms there. So these are all 
down conversion if the direction of all arrows in the entire figure are reversed then up conversion which is the same as second mode generation is shown instead so by considering the three cases we have seen before which is this one here one resonator two photons and uh, one resonator one photon and the other one we consider all three of them which are the ones over here one one two one one two so we consider these three in some detail that means that you already can follow this one here just reverse the arrows the other ones are a bit more complicated and more cumbersome but we'll just skip them for the moment so again, the James Cummings Hamiltonian conserves the excitation number here, photons and the atoms. Quantum Rabi conserves the parity and the generalized Rabi Hamiltonian eh, it's, uh, is the most general case. There are no restrictions on excitation number at all. And all of these models can be explained to realize use supernova circuits and also other systems. Okay, sorry, here the previous one is a summary of four-way mixing analog. So there is degenerate and non-degenerate. There are third harmonic generation, a conversion, third soft harmonic generation, non-conversion, hyper Raman type two, hyper Raman type two, stocks and test stocks. And then there are the non-degenerate ones, type one, type two, type three. So you can get more complicated if you put four resonators, three resonators, and then it gets but we have the condition that need to be satisfied, the transitions. Uh, there are many, many, many cases to consider, but the first author of this project was a former postdoc of mine. He was a grand master chess. So he has an incredible memory. He can memorize in, in like infinite number of chess patterns. He's like a number two rank in Japan. He's among the top ones in the world. He's very good. So he can memorize all of these and was able to help us to keep track of all of this. To describe this, we need to have Hamiltonian either Rabi or James Cummings, because the number of excitations changes by zero or two. So the James Cummings or standard quantum Rabi are enough. And these are described in different sections there. There are other nonlinear processes, and then uh, they require more intermediate steps to give lower effective coupling, multi-photon absorption, so it's one part of multi-photon Rabi oscillations, parametric processes, analog should be processed, and then care, which is one here, A dagger A squared, cross care, which is one here, and the, the Pockels effect, which is A dagger A and then B plus B dagger. These require like two different kind of operators here. This can be demonstrated in the dispersive regime of circuit QD. So therefore, let's look at a summary and outlook here. So therefore, we have been describing systems that have single qubits and resonators, which are either in the older cyclopic regime or close to it. This can realize analogs of many nonlinear optical phenomena, including three way mixing, four way mixing, higher harmonic, higher subharmonic generation, which is up on down conversion, multi photon absorption, parametric amplification, Raman hyper Raman scattering, care, cross care effects, focus effects, et cetera. It is like, it's really like a, it's like a very systematic study of many, many different effects. The analogs rely on effective couplings. These effective couplings are mediated by higher order processes involving virtual photons between system states. It's like when you do QED, you get two electrons interacting with each other, but there is this intermediate vector boson, which is the photon between them, when you have two neutrons interacting with this pi in which is your intermediate uh, process there or two quarks interacting gluons or many other processes that require these virtual particles which are like the 
that make the, the systems interact with each other. Of course, the effective coupling becomes weaker the more intermediate transition steps there are. But in the ultra strong coupling regime, it can remain strong enough to overcome the coherence. So this is what, that's why there is a race among different platforms to experiment and to be able to move in this direction and they be able to probe these effects because the effects are weak now. Some of them have been found, but they're still weak. So the, the goal is to eventually make them stronger and be able to explore this phenomena. And these involve single photons, no external drive, deterministic process only to level atoms. So these are different than before. In the classical case, there are many, many, many photons. You need an external drive. They are non-deterministic and involve many level atoms. And this can also provide new ways to create useful entangled states like W states, G, H states, and some other states. And experiments on these systems are in, uh, in, in uh, process. So therefore, I thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nori. Uh, it was a wonderful talk. Uh, you explained uh, such a complex subject so nicely. I think the student must be having a lot of questions. So it's uh, open for uh, questions, comment. And uh, students can ask uh, by unmuting themselves, or we can go to the chat box also and uh, see the question there yeah. and answer. So I'm looking at the first question here by China Gandhi is how to make an experiment setup to observe the energy levels of a particle in a box. This can be done in different systems. The standard one is semiconductor quantum dot via spectroscopy. So therefore you put light and you can excite the system and you can see spectroscopy or we saw before photoluminescence, the quantum dot has a photoluminescence signature which is outside the cavity and a different one inside the cavity. But inside the cavity, it reacts very differently if it is in resonance with the cavity or outside resonance. So spectroscopy is the way to see the energy levels. Also can be probed via, in the case of the circuits, via, via essentially uh, in the circuit via voltage probes. So therefore, okay, so therefore how oscillating mirror can stop annihilation mm -hmm. of particles. So this is the second question by Surachita. Okay, yeah. the, that that's the refers to the Moore effect. What Moore predicted, and it was seen experimentally, it took 40 years to be seen because people were looking at mechanical mirrors, but it's very difficult to do mechanical mirrors that move at relativistic speeds. So it's better to do electromagnetic mirrors because there is no mass involved. And the superconducting electronics does not, most electronics operates in hundreds of megahertz, maximum three gigahertz, but this is very difficult to do it eventually. Intel has been spending billions of dollars to go few gigahertz. Superconducting electronics can go easily 10, 20, 50 gigahertz easily. So therefore it can get to very high frequencies. So therefore, is, so the oscillating mirror, what it does is to prevent these virtual particles from recombining. That was the prediction. I was tested experimentally by groups in Chalmers, Finland. There are several groups who have seen this in the past few years, including more recent experiments in Chalmers last year, beautiful, beautiful data, which is just uh, stunning. So therefore this can be done with superconducting circuits. Now, question number three uh, by China Gandhi again is how can we practically control the number of photons? Or well, these people, can know, this is I'm talking to experimenters all the time, they know when there are one photon in the cavity, two, three, four, and for superconductor circuit, we're doing some experiments now where they go from one to 10, but when there's one to six, the response is linear. When you get to seven, eight, nine, 10, there's no linearity. So we're trying to understand that you can you go to 11 or 12 in the resonator of the qubit. So this can be monitored. One way to do it, if you have a, a Cooper per box, you have a capacitor. The capacitor changes the electric field. So essentially you're pushing charges in out of the box. So you can actually see the charges coming out, in and out, and in the above the superconducting temperature, 
is called single electron transistor. This was done in the 1980s and 90s. And, and then you can actually see as a function of the gate voltage, a peak, one electron left the, the, the quantum dot, another peak, a second electron left, a third and fourth. Also, they can be plotted as a Coulomb staircase. But when you change the gate voltage, you can see one electron at a time. But once you go below the superconducting temperature, you do not see one electron at a time coming. You see Cooper pairs, you see two electrons. And this can be seen because there is some, some uh, when you go below TC, there is some gaps so some of the energy levels. So you can go from zero extra electrons in the, or N to N plus two, N plus four. So you can actually monitor single electron coming in out of the box for the charge qubits or two in the superconducting case. In the case of the flux quantum, you can monitor each flux quantum, one phi naught, two phi naught, three phi naught. In the case of the cavity, one photon, two photons. All of these single electron transistor, single flux transistors, these are all uh, controllable. And then uh, uh, just like last Qu question in chat box yeah uh, just like product of a and a dagger oh it's just a... like product of a and a dagger produce the photon number of the operator no, in the in the case of the exactly so therefore you need to when you multiply sigma plus and sigma minus you can write it in terms of sigma x and sigma y essentially you're counting the number of excited atoms. So therefore, if you do this product, you could see that if one atom is in the ground state and then the product gives you zero. It doesn't matter if it is one or the other one. So therefore, it's, uh, you can just consider a different case. You can, you can count them. And then uh, how this process of... SPDC. What SPDC is spontaneous parametric down conversion. Okay, okay, spontaneous parametric conversion. Yeah. Miss, miss analog is affecting the presence of more photons than one. Okay, essentially, we are here considering the cases of one, two, or three photons, and then we did consider the, on, the, on the table. It's uh, oh, what's the effect of the temp? Oh, in this case, we're considering t equals zero because what the temperature does is to mess up the quantum effects because you have K Boltzmann T, K Boltzmann T is larger than H bar omega, then you're smearing out the, the quantum effects. That's why, for instance, for superconducting qubits, the experiments are done between 10 millikelvin, 50 millikelvin, 20 millikelvin, is to be able to remove the thermal effects. And then you can get some beautiful, nice quantum effects. If you put too much thermal effects, it's going to be uh, it's going to be messed up. So I think we took care of. Yeah, we have chat box. We have uh, taken care of. If there are any Excuse questions me, from participants, uh, they can unmute and ask. And we can take two three questions. Ex yeah. Excuse me, sir. I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, for different types of transitions. You have used like uh, JC model or Rabi model. Uh, how did you decide which model to be used for a different oh, transition? You need you need to see. You typically start with the most general model, and then if you see that n changes between zero and two, then you say, okay, fine. I do not need to use the Hobbitzer. I do not need to use this big uh, canon. I can just use a simplified model because the extra terms provide no new information. So you could in principle use all the time the most general model to cover all your bases, but then you realize that look for all these processes can be described by the simpler model. So you, you, you use the Occam's razor criteria to stick to the simplest model that can describe the phenomenon. And that's why we just simplified in the second table. Okay, okay, thanks. So, uh, one, one more question. Uh, like these transitions are very less probable, right, to occur. Like, yeah, sorry, compared to the other are... transitions, say one resonator, two qubit, like say one GG going to zero EE, uh -huh. the transition is less probable than uh, zero E, uh, zero GE transition, like one GG okay, to okay. zero G. 
Okay, so therefore, to know the probabilities, you need to see the coefficient multiplying it. So therefore, we have, you need to actually calculate and see what's the prefactor, and that gives you the amplitude of these probabilities. And they are not all equally likely. There are some more likely than other ones, but you're right, there are different weighting factors. And then these are all taken into account when you do this perturbation theory, you sum the terms. <clears throat> all these matrix elements tell you how how likely are the transitions to occur? Okay. Thank you. Hey, uh, if I can ask a question. Uh, yes, go ahead, please, of course. Yes, so, Even two uh, questions. To, <laughs> there, you get an extra bonus question. <laughs> thank you very much. Hmm. So there are uh, papers, they are talking about bound states in continuum, and uh, they're saying one can use these states to produce a large number of entangled photons. Some estimates say up to 10 power 12 uh, entangled photon pairs you can produce. So what is your comment on that? I wanted to, because you are very much into this field. Okay, so bound states in the continuum, that sounds more like a final resonance, no? I think so. So in that case, we have studied final resonances in a different context where you have, let's say, coplanar waveguide here and you put a qubit and the photos are coming and depending on the, on if it is in resonance or off resonance, the incoming photon can be scattered back or can be transmitted. And depending on, uh, Two, if you put two of these atoms, you can get bound states inside these atoms in between them. You can consider these two qubits inside the complainer waveguide as defects that tend to localize photons either on the qubits or between them, like a cavity. And depending if it is on resonance and off resonance, then they could get transmitted. But also depending on the nonlinearity to the qubit is possible to have the line shape, which is either bright Wigner, which is Lorentzian, or Fano, which is, which is non-symmetric. But the, the Fano is essentially involves a coupling between discrete states and a continuum, which is what you were describing. Now, every time you have this coupling between these discrete states and the continuum, there are these Fano resonance that they tend to provide the bright Wigner uh, reflectance or transmission, instead of being a Lorentzian, it tends to be tilted, asymmetric, and the symmetry has to be, uh, it relates to this coupling between the, the continuum and the discrete or the bound states. So this, we studied this in other papers when we were trying to to study photon bound state interaction. But in that case, they were like in a coplanar waveguide. You can imagine them to be in Dr. capacitor, Dr. capacitor, like a LC resonator chain. And then you put one qubit or two qubits. And there is interesting phenomena like, like the like uh, interference effects, uh, interferometry between them, uh, trapped photon states between the two qubits and uh, and in some cases, you can actually probe the, the bound states with the continuum. And that, that gives you the, the final resonances. Thank you very much. There uh, one more question in the chat box. So what is the maximum ratio of Rabi frequency and photon frequency mode that has been achieved in cavity QED? Okay, so therefore the largest one is like 1.3, which is the deep strong coupling limit. And then in that case, they were looking at the Wigner function of the system where you don't have an oscillator here and a qubit two level system here, but you have a tightly bound entangled oscillator qubit system. And then there is a very interesting question here, is there any software simulator to simulate optics? There is a very useful software which is used by many students and is highly recommended here, which is called, uh, I was going to talk about it, but it's called Q-tip. It is free. 
is open access. You don't have to pay anything to MATLAB or Mathematic. It's very popular and can be used for studying cavity QED, optomechanics, quantum optics, quantum information, waveguide QED, quantum circuits, quantum optimal control, stochastic dynamics, and is becoming very popular and, you, and actually allows the students to study a variety of models within a few lines of code because the codes have been optimized. You can put them on your laptop. You don't need to have a supercomputer. You can study a variety of systems that gives you the power to do simulated experiments on your laptop in many different systems, auto mechanics. If you look at this, is used more often the software D-Wave, Google, Microsoft, Rigetti. Is the only one which is more is QS Q the IBM one, but ours is becoming very, very popular. It's uh, it's uh, it's free. It's more than just citations. It's used by every company in the world is using them. Google, Northrop Grumman, Intel, Microsoft, and QRigetti. So therefore, there are many journals using it. So therefore, this is a powerful tool that any student can, you can grab, there is a website online. It was featured also in The Economist. There's a QT uh, the impact there in a paper in Nature talking about application specific stuff is becoming the software to study optomechanics, uh, quantum optics, quantum information is used in gazillion papers. Everybody it's just, uh, it's, it's very, very popular. And then there is tutorials. So if you can do it on your own, you can study the basic manipulation, tensor products, and uh, how to do dynamics, how to visualize, how to plot. And to, you try to do the block sphere on your own is a pain in the neck. But here you can get the block sphere animation right away. And you can actually see in real time the results. You can, you can do, there are many example notebooks on how to visualize it, how to do quantum circuits, how to do quantum time evolution, optimal control, all kinds of gates, stochastic uh, feedback control. It's just a uh, flocket formalism, block red field, and they're all pedagogical and involves also many, many volunteers have been working on this for a while. And there are people essentially write papers on how to essentially extend this. And some of the students actually, they, they have been joining something called Google Summer of Code to develop a software that added to Qtip. And then we're adding an ecosystem. We're adding tensor network libraries, permutation invariant, ultra strong coupling simulations, optimal control, a, a hierarchical equation of motions. So the whole thing is being expanded, expanded for scattering, uh, for um, dissipation modeling, uh, Markovian and Markovian environment. So the tool is very popular and students can access these uh, these are students actually doing TensorFlow data, quantum gate decomposition, a GPU uh, a implementations with local dissipation, global dissipation. So therefore, the students are, if you look at qtip.org, you can see these tools and allow you to study open quantum system because the Hamiltonian ones are boring. You want to see the system plus the environment. But then it doesn't go like two to the end, goes like four to the end, the Hilbert space, the Lewillian space. So to study Lewillians is hard to do it properly. And then, uh, and then we have the tools developed and students can actually use it for free. And, uh, and you can actually uh, study all kinds of problems uh, using Qtip and uh, either DK Hamiltonian and uh, can allow you to exponential space reduction. If you have some symmetry, you can actually, the course of dimensionality can be handled if there are no symmetries in the system. You can do all kinds of Hamiltonian. You can put collective two-level system, local, cavity, emission. You can put all kinds of terms. And you can do essentially your own numerical experiments on this. You can do non-classical light, super radiance, intrinsic condensation, super fluorescence, super emissions everything, the PTs, lacing, chaos, it's a very popular tool. But if I you think, use it, please mm -hmm. cite the papers if you use it, because some people are using it, but they are not citing because then we need to ask for funding. We need to tell the funding agency, look, give us more funding because this can be used for many different cases. So if you use it, please cite the 
original two papers on QTIP. And then I thank you for your time and uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Professor Nori, for very useful information to students regarding Q-tips. Uh, I think they will be using it and they will be referring also after using it. Okay. I Good. <laughs> so thank you very much. And other questions, they can uh, uh, send email to Professor Nori and uh, I think uh, he will find some time to address uh, those uh, questions if they have questions. Thank you very much. Okay, Thanks. okay. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye.